Greetings and welcome to our webinar today. Our topic is the telepractice delivery of LSVT Loud and LSVT Big, what you need to know. So hopefully everyone out there is doing well and staying safe and healthy. And we know this is a very interesting time right now. And so we hope that this webinar can help you all in some way um, to get through this, um, the crisis that we're all facing. So today I'll be your moderator. My name is Beth Peterson. I'm a speech language pathologist and I'm one of the LSVT Loud faculty instructors. And I'm joined by my colleagues, Thomas Gangemi, who's a physical therapist and one of the LSVT Big training and certification faculty instructors. And then also Angela Halpern, who's a speech language pathologist and one of the LSVT Loud faculty instructors. So we'll be here today presenting to you on this topic for both LSVT Loud and LSVT Big. For more information on your presenters, the biography is included on this page and then also in the handout that you should have received before the webinar or you can also access it during the webinar. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. But if you do wanna hear a little bit more about their background, you can find that on this slide here. We do like to acknowledge our funding support, which has helped make LSVT Loud and LSVT Big possible. So we've had funding from the National Institutes of Health, Office of Education, and you can see many other organizations listed on this slide here. In terms of disclosures, um, both Dr. Ganjami and Ms. Halpern have financial and non-financial relationships with LSVT Global. The non-financial relationships include a preference for the treatments, LSVT Big and LSVT Loud. Ms. Halpern is an employee and she receives lecture honorarium and travel reimbursement from LSVT Global. And Dr. Ganjami is a consultant for LSVT Global and also receives lecture honorarium and travel reimbursement. I'm going to just briefly go over the plan for the webinar so you know what to expect. Um, so again, we know the purpose of this webinar is to talk about the telepractice delivery of both of these treatment programs. Um, and with particular interest to right now going on with COVID-19, we know a lot of uh, the work is shifting to telepractice and clients are wanting that and clinicians are needing to do that. So that's a big reason why we're pushing this webinar out right now. Um, and for logistics, so right now, everyone in the audience, your microphone is automatically muted. And that's just to make sure that we don't have background noise from the various environments where you're joining us. But if you do have a question um, at any time during the webinar and especially during the Q&A that we'll have at the end, there's a ways that you can ask questions. The first is to type in your question and you can do that by clicking on the question box on your webinar control panel and then you can type in your question. I'll see the text of your question and I'll read it out loud for one of our presenters to respond to. You can also ask your question out loud if you click on the hand icon on your webinar control panel. I'll then see that you're raising your hand and then I'll call out your first and last name to let you know that I'm unmuting your microphone and you can ask your question out loud to the group and one of the panelists will address your question that way. And then you can always email us if you think of a question after the webinar and that's info at lsvtglobal.com and we'll have a slide at the end with that information. In terms of CEUs or continuing education units, so this webinar is not ASHA registered or state registered, um, but you can still receive a certificate for attendance and if you want to self-report your activity. Um, so you'll just need to email webinars at lsvtglobal.com following the, the webinar and let us know that you want a certificate and then we can send you a certificate. Again, this information is written on other slides, so you'll um, see that later on as well. Um, and then we're going to jump right in and do the presentation of the content today. We'll save some time at the end for questions. Um, hopefully we can get it done, wrapped up within the hour, but if we need to stay on, if there's a lot of questions coming in, we want to make sure we address as many as we can so we can stay on for five or ten minutes after um, if needed. And then whenever you exit the webinar, a survey should pop up automatically on your screen, and we do appreciate if you can take that survey. It should just take a few minutes. It helps us know what we're doing well, what we can improve on so that we can tailor these specifically um, to our audience. So if you can take that, we appreciate it. Again, it should pop up on the screen whenever you X out. So even if we stay on for five or so extra minutes to answer questions, if you need to sign off right at the hour mark, you can do that and the survey will still pop up. You'll also have the option to take the survey later. It will come to you in an email after you finish the webinar. Um, so as I mentioned, um, for reporting your CE activity, uh, this information tells you what to do. Basically, if you want a certificate of attendance, you can see the email on the screen, webinars at lsvtglobal.com. Just email us after you complete the webinar. 
um, and then we can send you a, a certificate. Again, you'll get an email about one hour after this webinar. It's automatically sent out to anyone who attends, and it will have this information in there, and it will have that email address, um, so you'll know exactly where to send it. You can just forward that email, say, I attended, and I would like a certificate. Um, attendance for the full hour is required in order to earn that certificate. And I covered how to ask questions. You can see that on this slide as well. You can type in your question, raise your hand, or email um, info at lsvtglobal.com. So I'd like to go over the learning objectives so you know uh, what we're going to talk about today and what we hope you'll take away from the webinar. So we hope that at the end of the webinar, participants will be able to define telepractice and telehealth, be able to discuss the research supporting the fidelity of LSVT Loud delivered over telepractice, which we refer to as LSVT eLoud. We also hope you'll be able to describe potential telepractice applications of LSVT Big, then be able to discuss some special considerations related to telepractice delivery, such as reimbursement and licensure regulations. You'll be able to identify resources for telepractice delivery of speech services, and then discuss the application to group maintenance classes, which we call Teleloud for Life and Telebig for Life, and then discuss considerations and exceptions for COVID-19 um, occurring right now. You will see some videos in this webinar today. So any clients that are shown in those videos have given their consent for the videos to be used for educational purposes. So we just say that they can't be copied uh, or viewed outside of this course uh, because again, it's only for educational purposes. That's the only consent that we have from the clients in the videos. I do wanna just run a quick poll so we know who's joining us today. So I'm gonna pull that up on the screen. And so we want to know, um, are you a physical or occupational therapist? And this would include students um, and then assistants as well. Or are you a speech therapist, an individual with Parkinson's, a family member or caregiver or, or other? So I'm going to launch that on your screen. So you should see that right now. And if you can just go ahead and take a minute to, to click on your circle or fill in uh, what you are so we know who we're, we're talking to today. Or it looks like most people have voted, so I'll just wait a few more moments. Okay, so I'll go ahead and close it. And it looks like, I think I can go ahead and share it too. So we have mostly physical and occupational therapists, a, a good majority of speech therapists, and then individuals with Parkinson's and then a small group of, of others. So we have a mix here today, so we'll make this make sure the webinar is tailored to everyone in our audience so that everyone can, can walk away with information pertinent to their own situation. Okay, so we'll go ahead and close that, move on to the next slide there. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Dr. Ganjami, who's gonna go ahead and get started with our, our content here today. Thanks, Beth, uh, and welcome, everybody. This is such an important topic, especially uh, at this time where we face our limitations with regards to how, where, and when we can see our patients, and people are eager to, to learn more and to get started. Um, telepractice or telehealth has been around a long time. Um, they've been using it to uh, deliver digital imaging, fiber optics, virtual reality, other technologies that enable clinicians to interface with their patients real time, no matter where they live. Back in 1967, Mass General actually utilized it for one of the first times, when they were able to effectively treat patients at Logan International Airport across the Bay, utilizing ultrasound technology. So it's, um, it's come a long way. Our various organizations that are listed below have given very strong support and recognition to telepractice and telehealth. And so I think that we can all feel very comfortable that yes, indeed, telepractice is an acceptable mode of delivery. Next slide. So with regards to terminology, uh, there are two principal terms that are utilized within this group. Um, so it was good to see that we have uh, PTs, OTs, and speech language pathologists on this webinar today. Telepractice has been referred to most often in the area of speech, and telehealth has been used most often in areas of PT and OT. It all refers to the same thing. So we will use those terms interchangeably today, 
but recognize that it's the same thing. It's defined as the use of electronic information and telecommunication technologies to remotely provide healthcare information and services real time. So it's similar to being a face-to-face -face interaction. Next slide. So this is the statement that was put out by ASHA, and it's been part of their code of ethics uh, since 2016. They expanded on it in 2018. Um, basically, at the phrase at the bottom of the slide is there are no inherent limits to where telepractice can be implemented as long as the services comply with national, state, institutional, and professional regulations and policies in place at the time. Next slide. And the APTA and the AOTA have also come out with position statements. Uh, the APTA uh, initially uh, back in uh, 2016 and seven, et cetera. Uh, AOTA in 2013 and 14. So I referenced those for the professionals on the call today to look at those and become familiar with them so that you know exactly where your organization stands in the delivery of telehealth or telepractice. Next slide. The rationale for delivering these protocols via telehealth are pretty simple. First, it increases accessibility to treatment. That's always been the case. Telehealth has been a great advent to clinicians who want to be able to increase the accessibility to their treatments for people who can't necessarily get to them, that they can get to the patient regardless of where they live. It also enhances the feasibility of LSVT Big and LSVT Loud, utilizing all 16 one-hour sessions in a given month. We can also then increase the frequency of long-term follow-ups. So we refer to these as tune-ups. So if it's difficult to be able to schedule and arrange for tune-ups for people who may have some difficulty getting into the office or for you to get to their home, you can follow them up via telehealth very, very effectively. It also diminishes the physical and mental burden of traveling to clinics, scheduling things, having caregivers and family members available to bring people to you or for you to go to their homes. So all, all of these four reasons are why LSVT Big and LSVT Loud are definitely appropriate for delivery via telehealth. So why has telehealth become so important now? We're in the middle of extreme circumstances where in-person delivery of services is no longer possible in most situations. With everyone staying at home, telepractice may be our only way to reach clients. It also allows us to, that to continue treatment that may have been interrupted with the stay-at-home provisions that most of us are currently living under. It also gives us the ability to reach those in need and allows us to stay in touch with people, helping to minimize the impact of social isolation, such as apathy and depression. Next slide. Well, thanks, Tom. I'll jump in here. So while the use of telepractice is new for some people, the delivery of LSVT loud via telepractice is actually well established and has research to support the outcomes that it can be comparable to therapy delivered in person. So we're going to talk about the research more in just a minute. But when LSVT loud is delivered via the internet, which as you saw earlier, we call eLoud, um, in order to ensure that people who are receiving this globally are getting the best and that the fidelity of LSVT loud treatment is really maintained the same as it would be in person when it's delivered via these teleservices, we have this training course that LSVT loud certified therapists can take, which really walks them through all the logistics and guidelines for delivery. It's important to have these types of courses available because a growing number of national SLP associations are now requiring that clinicians are trained and competent in telepractice delivery. Next slide, please. 
So here's a list of some of the research that I mentioned exists to support LSVT Loud delivered via telepractice. Our colleagues in Australia under the leadership of Deborah Theodorus have led much of this brilliant research. And if anyone wants more specifics on any of these articles, we're happy to provide them. But as I mentioned before, outcomes for this in-person have been comparable, um, out, outcomes for the tele have been comparable to what we see to in-person therapy. Next slide, please. When we think about telepractice for LSVT Big, this application for physical and occupational therapy is more recent of a concept. So because of that, research studies don't yet exist for telepractice delivered via LSVT Big, just as there isn't research yet for many of other types of physical and occupational therapies delivered via telepractice. However, in light of COVID-19, where in-person visits aren't allowed, teleservices for PT and OT are being allowed and can serve as a more viable means of service delivery. Could be used for routine visits with current LSVT big patients. Um, and so that by routine, we're meaning applying to those who have already started LSVT big but whose care may have been interrupted due to COVID-19 and stay-at-home orders. It could be used for LSVT big tune-up sessions. And we'll talk about tune-ups in a bit, but these are these check-in sessions that happen every three to six months once someone's finished therapy. And also it could be used for continued practice of exercises via maintenance classes called Big for Life. And we'll talk about Big for Life and the speech part, Loud for Life, in a bit to come. Tom's going to get into this in more detail later, but just keeping in mind, many insurance providers are now making temporary emergency provisions for telehealth due to COVID-19. Some had already covered it um, and some are expanding their continued coverage. So you have to check with every carrier and you'll get more details about that to come. Next slide. Some equipment specific to telepractice delivery. And this would apply to both LSVT Loud and LSVT Big, is first of all the computer. You want to consider the age of the computer. Both the client and the clinician need a computer for the teleplatform. If the computer's older, it may have a slower processing and won't work as well for telepractice. For LSVT Big, it's really important that you have a computer and you're not using a smartphone because you really want that large screen so you can see the therapist, the client, and have that bigger image, and also it's more steady. You'll want a high-speed internet connection. Uh, it could be hardwired or Wi-Fi. The thing to just keep in mind with Wi-Fi is making sure it's dedicated, it's not being shared by lots of people, so that you have um, the, the speed that you need for good transmission. We're going to talk in a minute about some different web conferencing platforms that might be used. And then you would, of course, need a webcam to see each other. Many of these are built in into laptop computers, especially. Microphone, either built in or external. And then speakers so you can hear each other. Next slide. So when we think about some of the platform options, there's several different um, options out there. Subscribing to use a certain platform will be the responsibility of the therapist. So for the client, if you're receiving the services, many times all you have to do to join a session is to click on a link that's sent to you by the therapist. The idea with most of these platforms then is that there wouldn't be a cost associated to the patient using them. So some different categories, there's business oriented platforms listed here, such as WebEx, Adobe Connect, GoToMeeting, or Zoom. And for use of delivery of these for therapy services, there are additional HIPAA compliant versions that can be utilized. Then there's some platforms that were designed specifically for healthcare professionals, such as VC, DoxyMe. And then there's some that were designed specifically for speech therapy, such as Blink Session, TheraPlatform, TheraV. And some of these have a little more interactive features for reading materials, whiteboards, things like that. Then we have the category of platforms that we say are in public domain. These are not recommended because they haven't been validated for security or encryptions. And these would be things like FaceTime, Skype, or Google Hangouts. Next slide, please. 
So with some specific considerations for these platforms, a few more details, the necessities for LSVTE Loud and LSVT Big, we need that reliable and clear internet connectivity. So you want a good video and audio quality. So you can really see and hear, useful for modeling and shaping by the therapist. The platform technology, um, does it offer support? So if you're into a session and there's some sort of tech issues, is it easy to call for support? Is it HIPAA compliant? And a way that makes platforms HIPAA compliant is a vendor will provide a signed business association agreement, a BAA. And Tom will touch on this a bit more in the privacy and security section that comes up later. Some helpful features, can the therapist upload documents? Can they share reading materials? Could you share a screen? What about whiteboard features to make notes? And then what about the placement of the video? Is there room to view the documents? For LSVT Big, is there room to see the entire uh, movement of the client? Some of these platforms also have templates for note taking, integration of EMR, secured messaging. So all sorts of considerations there. Next slide, please. This is a picture of the equipment that would be needed during LSVT Loud and LSVT Big treatment sessions. For both LSVT Loud and LSVT Big, a computer is required. And then we also recommend having a phone handy, and this would be for both the therapist and the client. The phone is helpful in case the computer connection gets lost or there's emergency and you need to get a hold of each other. For LSVT Big, both the client and the clinician need a sturdy chair. For LSVT Loud, the equipment I'm going to talk about next is only needed by the therapist. The client does not need to have this equipment. And that's because this is what's used for quantification of the um, objective data taken during the session. So the therapist will need a way to collect sound pressure level at a consistent distance, such as using a sound level meter, a way to document duration, such as a stopwatch, and something to collect frequency or pitch data, as can be seen in the app on the middle on the left there. The therapist might also use the LSVT companion system pictured in the upper left-hand corner. And this could also be used on the client's end as well if they wanted some of that feedback. It automatically collects all these acoustic variables that I just mentioned. For calibration, it's important for speech therapists to have a digital recorder for playback of the voice. And for LSVT Big, it can be really helpful if there's a helper handy to videotape the client so they can see themselves. These audio and video recordings can be really helpful as we get into sensory feedback so our clients can see or hear that the voice that feels too loud or the movement that feels too big is really within normal limits. Next slide, please. Some considerations for the setup. Water is important, so good for vocal hygiene and good for physical exercise. So we want to keep that water at a safe distance from the computer. The camera position. For LSVT Loud, we want to be able to see the face and the upper chest. For LSVT Big, seeing the whole body and sitting and standing. And as I just mentioned, it can be helpful if there's a helper who could videotape things like the big walking and those things. Um, for LSVT Loud, we want a tape measure to get consistent mouth to microphone distance. The phone, I already mentioned, is a backup for tech issues, quiet, distraction free room, and the therapist can send those think loud or think big signs ahead of time. If people have a printer or typing stand for LSVT Loud for readings and homework, that can be helpful, but those can also be shared electronically. Next slide, please. Patient safety, of course, um, this is an important topic and I'm going to turn this back over to Tom now to dig into this in more detail. Thanks, Angela. So with LSVT Big, uh, balance and safety are very apparent, balance and safety issues are very apparent to us. Um, we wanna make sure that is there someone at home that can provide some assistance. Uh, with regards to ensuring loudness and good quality, the speech therapist is going to implement their clinical expertise to shape and model the voice to ensure that the voice produced is with normal loudness and good quality. 
There's never going to be an instance where a person is yelling or screaming or being too loud. It's always with good quality voice. When you begin your treatment session, um, and I recommend this uh, even before you start the treatment session, obtain emergency contact information. So find out the name and phone number of someone that you can call in case something should happen during the course of the treatment to notify them that your patient needs some assistance. Get the address and the phone number as to where the person is located at that time. So if your patient is living in uh, an apartment in a senior living community, make sure you have that address in case you need to send some assistance. Um, so that's always important to not just get that on the first time that you speak with them, but every single session, because sometimes people do go maybe to a family member's home or someplace else. Always review your emergency policy with the patient. Let them know that there may be a situation where they're going to need some assistance. Perhaps they've fallen or something else has happened during the course of the treatment session and that you may dial 911 to ask for assistance at that level. Um, very often it's, it's helpful to tell people that right up front so that if they need to uh, make sure that their door is accessible, et cetera, they can do that in advance. Next slide, please. Seamless technology is definitely the key success to success because you're relying completely on the technology in order to deliver your treatments appropriately. It should not get in the way. And one of the best things I reckon people do is practice, practice, practice before you actually engage in telehealth or telepractice live. So go ahead and set up a couple of uh, practice sessions with family members or friends or colleagues so that you become familiar and comfortable with the technology on your end. Go through that checklist of things that make sure you want to shut down all other programs, um, remove any plugins that might be operating, and make sure that your camera is actually working and visible. Uh, one of the things that is important in the days of Wi-Fi is to see that there are other C streaming services going on in your house or in the patient's house to turn that off because that will definitely impact the quality of the uh, reliance of the information. Have contingency plans set up in case something should happen during the treatment time and you lose connection. So you might be able to pick up the phone and just continue with some of the things that are that you were working on at the time because you want to make sure that you keep that motor system stimulated for the entire time. Next slide. Is there any difference between delivering LSVT loud and LSVT big via telehealth versus in, in, in person? No, it's exactly the same. We're going to be delivering four consecutive treatments, four days a week, four weeks in a row for a full hour. We're going to be following all of the techniques. We're going to adhere to all the principles of neuroplasticity and motor planning. And we're going to include homework as well as daily carryover assignments every single day. Next slide. So the LSVT loud and big daily exercises, we go through the same repetitions. You're going to use your clinical judgment as to whether or not um, they need even more repetitions or maybe you need to pace yourself a little bit differently because of the technology. And that's probably something you'll experience the first few times that you work with patients via telehealth. Um, and that there are also some COVID-19 specific functional phrases and tasks People are in their homes. They're not going to be going outside or out to the restaurants that they used to go to. So they're not going to be able to practice those functional component tasks uh, verbally and physically that you may have used in different situations. So focus on things that they can do in the confines of their home. Next slide, please. So the hierarchy tasks are also the same as they would be in, in um, a face-to-face -face situation but they're going to be potentially more meaningful to them because you're going to be working with them right in their own environment. So ecological factors such as the dog barking in the background or someone walking into the room, these are all things that they encounter in their real life all the time. But when you work with them in an office, you don't always have the ability to impose those things during a treatment session. So it actually becomes a better case scenario 
to be able to work with people in real time, in real life, where they live and where they experience their challenges. Some of the examples with LSVT Big, of course, things like putting on your jacket, standing up and walking to the kitchen, getting in and out of bed, have a helper videotape that and potentially put yourself in the same type of environment of getting in and out of bed, up and down out of a chair, walking through a doorway, so you can have someone who's working with you, the clinician, use your camera to video you doing it so that you can demonstrate to your patient that way. Next slide, please. So utilizing things such as an iPad, a smartphone, et cetera, to record any recording application that can play back and forth so that you can take a look at, listen to, um, use these scales that we're all familiar with um, to calibrate people and to encourage them to use those things in real life daily activities, because that's our goal both with LSVT Big and LSVT Loud, is that they're not just working on exercises, they're learning to use these things in everyday life. And that's the heart of our success. Next slide. So just to, to summarize with the practicing of the carryover assignments, the same frequency as in person, utilize your homework helper DVDs and videos, as well as the LSVT companion videos. They are very, very helpful. Um, you can also email assignments and reminders or text them emails and, uh, or text them reminders as to what their carryover assignment is for the day. You can encourage people to talk to their uh, different te uh, technologies that they have at home, Alexa, Siri, or utilize FaceTime calls. Um, always stand up and take that big stretch during the course of the day. So these are some simple things that you can do in terms of carryover assignments. I'll turn this over to Angela. All right, great, thank you, Tom. Um, and with the Alexa example, I just um, had someone that was a part of one of the Loud for Life classes that we'll be talking about in a bit, and several of her functional phrases are to Alexa. So it's very functional. She has to speak loud enough for Alexa to be able to hear her and respond appropriately. So what we're going to get into next is because a picture, in this case, a video is worth a thousand words, we thought it would be most efficient to show you what an eLoud session would look like. So we have a very short video that will demonstrate just a few of the components of an LSVT Loud treatment session. You're going to see the therapist, Cynthia, working with a client, and the filming is taken from the, the room the therapist is in. And then you'll see in this particular example, the therapist is collecting her data using the LSVT companion system. Keep in mind, this data could also be collected with a sound level meter and those other types of equipment that I mentioned earlier. So Beth, let's go ahead and show that video now. Hey, good morning. Good morning, how are you? I am glad to see you this morning. I had two glitches on my computer and I wasn't sure I was going to get it working again. Oh. <laughs> All right, let me just measure my distance here to my microphone and the computer. And we're going to start with those big ahs. Oops. So. When you're ready, let's start with a nice big ah. Uh... Ah. Uh... I agree. Got to pump it up a bit more. When you're ready, Scooty, I want that full 
Good Good morning, morning. Jeannie. How's it going today? See you tomorrow. Have you checked our emails today? What are we having for dinner tonight? I cannot believe how much junk mail we get. Sorry, I cannot talk to you right now. I have to get my walking in. What time do we have to get going tomorrow? Do you want a glass of wine tonight? Good, I like it. I like it a lot. The goal is keep your voice loud. So even if you jumble on the words, the keep that eight keep effort all loud. the time. You jumble okay. On the words, okay. All right. So let's start with a fish tail. First one is a fish tail. Okay. I had just let's spent seven days exploring the broken group islands with the four others in my group. I was making the crossing from Gilbert to the docks at Sea Heart, Sea Chart. I was sad to be leaving because it was such a great experience but glad to be getting to the dock and cleaned up for the trip home. Okay, so your voice just was sounding good. Who did you wow with it last night, yesterday? Okay. So, well, we had an interview uh, with one of our salespeople and I talked very loudly to her and she said she thought that my voice was louder than it had been before, so. Excellent. Another person noticed it, so. Good. All right, thank you for that. Um, so that just gives you a little sample of what a session would look like. And of course, in this one hour webinar, we're only able to provide little bits and pieces of these overviews. Um, and we have more details for those of you who are LSVT Loud therapists and want to deliver LSVT via eLoud in the whole two hour um, webinar. And we'll bring up more information on that at the end. So now we're going to look at a sample of LSVT Big, and because this is newer, this was a telesimulation that Tom and I did to show you a sample again of some of the exercises. So let's go ahead and take a look at this video now. Now, let's get started. Tell me, how did things go yesterday with your carryover assignment? And what was it and how did it go? Um, you wanted me to practice my big walking and use my big movements to put my coat on because um, I've been struggling with take forever to get my coat on. And it went, I, I really felt like I was being really too big with the movements, but my husband um, saw me doing it and he said it looked normal and he thought I did a really good and I was able to get the coat on in, in much less time than usual. Excellent. Okay. Well, let's start off doing our exercises. Let's do that together one time. Reach out big, down to the floor, up to the ceiling big, and back big. Big open hands and count with your loud voice. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, ten, finish big. That looked good. How did it feel? It felt pretty good. All right, let's do um, seven more. Let's do seven more times. I want you to put as much effort into it as you can with your right hand. Okay. There you go. And reach up and across and look up there and count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, ten, finish big. I like the way that you were driving with that foot really hard. I could see the effort you were putting into that. Ready? Okay. One, and back. Two, and back. Big posture. Three, and back. And four, and back. Good. Now let's do the other side. Very good. So next time that you walk into the kitchen, step big through the doorway like that, and then step okay. right over towards the refrigerator. Reach out big and stand up. Reach out big and sit down. Reach out and stand up. Reach out and sit down. Grab the jacket this time. Reach out. Grab it and bring it in. 
reach out, grab it, and bring it in. So Angela, I know that uh, you and your husband go for walks every day. So today, what I'd like you to do as your carryover assignment is instead of letting him go and open the door for you, I want you to walk with big steps up to the door, grab that door handle, and pull the door open nice and big. And then once both of you are outside, I want you to reach back and close the door with gusto. Okay? All right, so that gives you a sample of what LSBT bid could look like via Tella. So we're going to move on next to a slide talking about client candidacy. Keep in mind as we talk through this that this does not mean these things are exclusionary. It's just considerations um, for therapists, physical, occupational, or speech therapists, as you might be thinking about which types of clients might be appropriate. So some things to consider, and I'll go ahead and talk through some of these and it'll appear on your screen in a minute here, is can the client sit in front of a monitor? Can they attend to the session? Can they see the material on a computer monitor? What's their level of hearing acuity? Do they have normal hearing, a hearing loss? Just like in LSVT Loud, if someone has a hearing loss in your clinic, you may just have to bump up some of that feedback but remember that the sensory mismatch that happens is a central, not a peripheral issue. So you're gonna work with people along all of the continuum there. Speech intelligibility. It's um, once again, not exclusionary, but how does that impact your ability to communicate over the internet? The cognitive ability, can they follow your directions, operate the equipment? How comfortable are they with technology? If they're not as comfortable, is there someone there who could help out? What's their manual dexterity to operate the keyboard? Again, could there be someone there who could help out? Is there the willingness of someone if they do need assistance? Um, and for LSVT big, maybe this is they need someone to, as a standby assist if there's some balance concerns. So is there a family member, someone who can help with that? Any cultural linguistic considerations? And um, do they have access to tech support as needed? Of course, as the physical therapist, you're going to consider things related to fall risk, postural instability, as you're considering who might be the most appropriate. And Beth, I'm not seeing those slides coming up yet. I don't know if they're appearing. There we go. There it is. Okay, so this is just an overview of everything that I was just talking about, and you'll have that for a reference in your handout. So next slide, some other caveats to candidacy is we say, give everyone a chance. Don't make assumptions. Clients who may not meet that key criteria, but they're very motivated and they have extensive home support, they could still have great success. So the focus of the telepractice session on the screen could also, in fact, maybe help people who have more cognitive impairment. They don't have as much distraction from the environment. Um, for those people who are a little further on the um, impairment scale, maybe they're going to feel less fatigued because they don't have to travel. So they have more effort and energy to put into the session. They can be more attentive. Next slide, please. There's many different options for implementation. For LSVT Loud, perhaps you're doing the assessment and treatment all in person, and then you're doing periodic follow-up sessions that happen every three to six months via the internet or that e-lab. Perhaps the assessment's done in person, then all or a varying portion of the treatment is done via e-lab. Perhaps you're doing everything, the assessment, the treatment, and the follow-up all via e-lab. For LSVT Big, telehealth might be used to continue with those routine visits with current LSVT, LSVT Big patients, or perhaps for tune-up sessions for clients who have already finished with the treatment. Next slide, please. So post-assessment and follow-up, same guidelines we would use as in person. Following LSVT treatments, it's always recommended that there's some routine follow-up to maintain the gains that are made during treatment. So as therapists, we wanna ensure that what we're doing is um, motivating to people. So there's a variety of things that can be tried. 
So the biggest one is during treatment that the home practice routine has been really well established and the patient has taken the responsibility for this so they continue to do it on their own. As therapists, we might send quick emails that just say, ah, or are you thinking loud? Are you moving big? We recommend that LSBT therapists check in with their clients every three to six months to see how the clients are doing with their home practice. Are they maintaining? Do they need a couple of tune-up sessions? I mentioned the picture um, identified of the computer software system called the LSVT Companion. This can be used for continued home practice after LSVT Loud. It provides auditory and visual feedback that's individualized to each person. We have the Hallmark Helper videos that are on DVD or download and streaming that can be used as a little motivator. And then just like we do for live, we have um, a motivating means of continued practice called Loud for Life and Fit for Life exercise classes, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit more detail here. So Loud for Life and Big for Life are group exercise classes for people who have graduated from LSVT Loud or LSVT Big. The classes typically meet weekly and the in-person uh, version of these and people work together on their daily exercises, functional conversation, movement activities. So I've been leading a class in the Denver area for several years now and it's, it's really a blast. It's the highlight of my week. It provides a very motivating format for exercise practice and that social engagement among my class members. And then they all report it, it helps them, gives them those continued reminders for doing home practice. Because the in-person classes aren't currently available with the COVID virus, we created televersions of these classes. And these classes are currently offered at no cost from LSBT Global on Fridays. So if you're a person who has previously completed LSVT Loud or LSVT Big Treatment, or if you're a therapist, you have clients who have previously participated in LSVT treatments, have them contact us about registering for the class. Um, we've had some, some great feedback and success on these initial classes. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna now turn it back over to Tom to talk about privacy and security and reimbursement and licensure. So these are some very, very important uh, points for us to be mindful of when we are considering embarking on delivering uh, LSVT big and LSVT loud via telehealth. Next slide, please. So with regards to privacy and security, we'll just read the first sentence, it's very important. Clinicians providing services via telepractice or telehealth are bound by federal and state regulations just as they would be when providing in-person services. So all the policies and procedures that you normally follow in an in-clinic or in-home environment, you need to follow those as well. In addition to that, because you're using a new form of technology, be mindful of the impact of HIPAA and privacy practices with regards to having a business associates agreement known as a BAA. Um, there's a lot of information that you can obtain about a BAA, but essentially, if you are the therapy provider, you're going to be contracting with another company to serve as the intermediary, and they're going to have access to a certain amount of patient information. And that's where the BAA is very important so that you know what their liability is and that they will tell you exactly what they're going to do in case there is a breach of that confidentiality on their end. Next slide, please. Some other things to be mindful of with regards to privacy and security. Secure the treatment room, and that pertains to both where you're located as well as where the patient is located. Can someone unexpectedly walk into the room or come in view of the camera? Can others hear the session that's going on? Make sure that there's some transparency of the individuals present. So I use the term here, scan the room, but also ask who is in your room, who is within your home at this time? And I tell them the same thing in case I might have an associate or a technician with me in my treatment space, I want them to know who they are and why they're there. Always obtain documentation of conform, informed consent for treatment and specifically for telehealth. Most states do require a specific um, informed consent for telehealth. 
and some insurance companies do as well. So please check your State Practice Act as well as your state licensing boards to find out what those requirements are and be sure that you have the appropriate consent forms signed before you begin treatment. And also before you begin each treatment, just remind them that you are providing services via telehealth, obtain their verbal consent for that particular treatment session, and always let them know that it is their option to choose to discontinue the treatment and wait until an, an online or a real site visit is, is possible. Next slide, please. Reimbursement is, is certainly an important topic, not only for the therapist providing the services, but also for patients. So let's take a quick look at things that were in place prior to COVID-19. So these are things that were That are listed below. Medicare prior to COVID-19 did not allow for coverage for telepractice or telehealth and Medicare beneficiaries could not receive telehealth and pay for it privately. So there was a major restriction as to what people who were Medicare beneficiaries could do. Um, Medicaid is always determined on a state by state level and private pay it's always important to be able to check and see what the requirements are. But again, prior to COVID-19, Medicare beneficiaries were not able to enter into a private agreement with therapists to pay them cash. Next slide, please. However, um, about a month and a half ago, CMS came out with some new rulings that indicated that um, telehealth services were statutorily excluded from audiologists, speech language pathologists, also for physical therapists and occupational therapists. What that did was it gave the therapists and the patients opportunity to bill and receive cash payment from patients even if they were or are Medicare beneficiaries. So that does open up an opportunity both from patients perspective as well as clinicians, but it would be on a cash basis and it would not be uh, billable or reimbursable by Medicare or their secondary insurance as well. Next slide. Now is a very unique time to advocate for the rights of people to receive your services via telehealth. We're in, in many situations, the insurance companies have opened up the scope and breadth of telehealth, and so many more people are starting to utilize it. We can start to document and illustrate what the benefits are, the cost effectiveness of it from travel, time, fatigue, that we're able to see more people from a remote distance and that it's a very, very good way for us to provide services. Grassroots activities are always very effective and your professional associations have on their websites uh, some templates to use and where to find your representatives, but also to send your feedback to CMS and Medicaid because they want to know what's important and how can they uh, truly frame things that are appropriate for you and your clients. Next slide. General licensure regulations still apply. Uh, when you're delivering telehealth or telepractice, you need to be licensed in the state where the patient is at at that time, which means if you live in Illinois and you're treating a person in Ohio via telehealth, you need to be licensed in that state. And you have to adhere to the Practice Act of that state as well. So you do have the ability to see people cross state lines, but you need to be aware of what those rules and regulations are as you do move about the country. Internationally, if you can look at some other uh, sources of information listed down below specifically for ASHA, and uh, some PT and OT rules and regulations are on their websites as well. Next slide. So how to get started with LSVT Layout and LSVT Big if you're a, an individual looking to start one of these clinical protocols, uh, you can ask your physician for a referral or a prescription. 
um, and contact an LSVT Loud or LSVT Big Certified Clinician by going to our website and search based on uh, the service that you're looking for and by your zip code. And it'll give you a list of therapists within your area. Next slide, please. If you are looking for a therapist uh, and you haven't received a direct referral to go to anyone in particular, these are some of the questions that you want to ask when you're interviewing clinicians. Do you deliver the gold standard dosage of LSVT loud and LSVT big? Let them know that you understand that it's four days a week for four weeks, that the individual treatments are 60 minutes in duration, and that you do in fact want to be receiving homework and carryover assignments. Ask them how many patients have they seen and what are their typical outcomes? And do they have a follow-up plan or a maintenance plan for you to follow, such as Big for Life and Loud for Life. Next slide, please. Okay, I'll turn this back over to Angela. Great, thank you, Tom. So we have a list of things for you here, additional resources. Many of you, because you're on this webinar today, are aware that we offer these monthly webinars webinars on hot topics, and then these are recorded on demand. So we have a whole on-demand library. On our website, we have a section that has more specific information for those of you who are attending today who said you're a person with Parkinson's. There's a whole um, portion of our website with additional resources. We have featured blog articles, testimonials, videos. And then I touched on with the Tell Aloud for Life and Tell a Big for Life, we're now during this time offering these free classes for people who have graduated from LSVT Loud or LSVT Big and those are on Fridays. And then for those of you who maybe are interested in the therapy but haven't had a chance to participate, on Wednesdays we're offering a 30-minute um, overview of the therapies with a little small demo so you can get a flavor of what the therapies are about. So for any of those, contact us and we'll show you the contact information at the end and we can get you set up for those classes. For those of you attending who are LSVT certified therapists, we do have more in-depth webinars specific to telepractice for LSVT Loud and LSVT Big. Those are recorded on demand and you can find those in your clinician account. Next slide, please. So in summary, we see the need exists for certain clients who are appropriate to be seen via telepractice. We've shown you that research demonstrates treatment outcomes from eLoud telepractice delivery are consistent with those outcomes that we see for in-person LSVT Loud delivery. Equipment and technology must be tested. We don't want that to get in the way of effective treatment. Next slide, please. And that clinician privacy is very, very important, just like for in-person. You need to have all those typical uh, measures in place and more that Tom described. Special considerations, there are some related to reimbursement and licensure, which Tom also reviewed with you. And very importantly, this protocol for LSVT Loud and LSVT Big does not change when delivered via telepractice. Next slide. So I'm going to turn it over to Beth now and she's going to open it up for questions. All right, thank you both Angela and Tom for a great overview on this topic. So as Angela mentioned, I'll go ahead and open it up for questions. We've had a couple come through. Um, and just so that you know how to ask questions, you can type in the question box on your webinar control panel, or you can raise your hand. You can do that by clicking on the hand icon in your webinar control panel, and then I'll call out your first and last name to let you know that I'm unmuting your microphone and you can ask your question out loud to the group. And the third way to ask questions is through emailing us, and that email address is on the slide here, info at lsvtglobal.com. So we will stay on for five or 10 minutes to make sure we address the questions. But as I mentioned earlier, if you need to sign off now, we're at the hour long mark, you can sign off and you'll still have access to that survey. It should pop up on your screen as soon as you X out of your uh, the webinar control panel here. You'll also receive the survey and a follow up email here today. Um, so let me go ahead and pull up some questions. All right, so the first one that came through, um, and this doesn't specify LSVT loud or LSVT big. Um, so 
maybe you can both touch on it. And Angela, if you want to get started. So it says, what are contraindications for telepractice? Okay, great. Yes, I'll give some um, ideas and then Tom, if you want to jump in. So I'll cover more specifically to LSVT Loud for speech therapists. Um, you're going to use your clinical expertise as a speech therapist, just as you would do for in-person sessions when you're deciding if someone's appropriate. So, you know, reviewing the medical chart, are there any things that, um, any other medical conditions that might be contraindicated, cardiac respiratory issues that first need clearance from a doctor, um, anything going on laryngeally, um, and so going through those same decision-making um, protocols. Now, if you think about the slide that I showed that talked about client candidacy, you know, there are some things to consider on who um, telepractice might be most appropriate for, um, you know, individuals who might have more difficulty um, than others, but I wouldn't let any of those be um, barriers as far as the client candidacy from deciding whether or not to move forward. It just may be that you need extra helpers or things in place. So there's really not one blanket um, contraindications. It's using the expertise and the clinical expertise of the clinician, just as they would do for in-person therapy, looking at the whole uh, medical history of the individual to decide if LSVT lab is appropriate. Tom, I don't know what you have might have to add there. Mostly with regards to safety, their physical safety with regards to balance, uh, fall opportunities, uh, the lack of having someone available in case they need that certain level of assistance. So similar to what you might find in the clinic, that if no one was there with you and with them, would they be safe? So again, just any safety issues. All right, great. Thank you both for that response. Um, Angela, if you want to take this next one. So I am licensed, this is a clinician. I am licensed in four different states. Does the LSVT website allow you to list more than one state that you are able to treat patients remotely? So if you, um, when you become, if you're LSVT lab certified and then you've taken the telepractice webinar and, and if you haven't had a chance to do that, that's the one that was, um, we did last week and that's on demand, then you have the option to be listed as an e loud provider. And so what, how that currently works on the website is your e loud provider status will show up in the state associated with where you live. But what we can do with our office, and actually we're getting a lot of requests from this from people in the office right now wanting to know other options pe states people are licensed in as they're getting questions, is you can have that information in your account and then um, our staff would have that available as questions come in. So that's certainly, um, while the website will show you in the state you are, we can also have that information to provide. And then if people go into more details on your account, that's also an additional place on the website that they would be able to see that when they click on you as an eLAL provider under the more details section. All right, thank you, Angela. And Tom, I'll have you take this next one. So how practical is it to mold and shape a patient during the big walking portion of an LSVT big visit? One way to do that is uh, certainly through your voice um, and, for, and modeling. Um, you're not gonna be able to be there to use your hands to shape them, but perhaps you can isolate certain aspects of their gait pattern and work with them on those aspects one-on-one -on -one and then implement that into their gait and stride. All right, thank you, Tom. And Angela, if you can take this one. Um, so the Telebig and Teleloud for Life online group um, is at what time on Fridays? And what is the best way for participants to contact you about participating in this? Yes, so um, contacting this info at lsbtglobal.com is the general that you see on the slide here. Um, also on our website, if people go to the blog and to the events, there is a direct registration link there. So you just go to the LSBT Global website, you click on the blog at the top, you'll see events and you'll see it listed there. The times um, are noon, Eastern for the Loud for Life, Tell a Loud for Life, 
and I believe it's um, two Eastern. Tom, can you confirm that? I don't have that right in front of me for the Big for yes, Life. It's, it's two Eastern for Big for Life. And it, they have, um, we've been doing this a few weeks now and it, it's really been fun um, to, in a great motivating way, the feedback I'm getting from people in the Tell Aloud for Life is, you know, it's so great to interact with other people across the country. Um, they're enjoying meeting other people and, you know, it's a great way to continue to practice when they can't get out of their house. Great, thank you. And on that same topic, um, Angela, for that loud um, for life via telepractice. So she's the clinician is saying, I imagine all the participants have to be muted or else it would be chaotic. So how can you ensure that participants are completed the exercises and using their voice appropriately? So what um, we do with this is it's actually interesting when you start to run a session because your comment would be what I would have thought before I did my first session. But um, you can actually tune into, and, and different people get loud at different times, the, even during a simultaneous awe, for example, and see what people are doing. And then just like when you're doing e-loud, you also will be able to look at, you know, are there any extrinsic signs of hyperfunction or tension that as the, per, the class leader, you know, I'm modeling more of an open mouth, I'm modeling more of those relaxed shoulders. So what's done together as a group are the ahs and the highs and lows. And then the rest of it, the functional phrases and any of the conversation cognitive tasks, there people are talking individually. So we're listening for that hour and giving feedback on those loud voices individually. And then, um, so for most of it, we have everyone's mics unmuted. Um, if I wanna give specific instructions and make sure everybody hears me, I may temporarily mute them, but it, it's worked really quite well. The other thing that's really nice about these tele for life classes is remember Tom was talking about that ecological validity of when you're doing therapy in someone's home. So the other day in a tele class, we had a treasure room and we broke people into small breakout rooms of smaller groups and they shared a treasure from their house. So they might be talking about a painting on the wall or um, you know, a particular item that was really special to them. And so that was a lot of fun. And you can't do things like that in the in-person group. Thank you, Angela. Um, and Tom, I'll have you take this next one. Um, so do you have any suggestions for how to maximize big walking in the home, especially when space is limited and if they don't have the ability to videotape themselves? Do you have them walk off screen? I do a combination of things. I work with them standing in one place um, and, and doing some big stepping in place, swinging their arms, getting all the individual components of, of walking big while they're standing in place. I really emphasize the step forward and reach uh, of the exercises and overlay that into their big walking. And then I have them do their best of go ahead and walk right towards the camera. So if there's no one else there to videotape them, use the amount of space that you have available, use the camera um, clarity and perception of depth that's available, and then tweak it a little bit. Um, this is a, a, a wonderful technology, but none of us are really proficient with it. So it's gonna take some time for you to play around with it. Again, maybe have one of your family members or a friend serve as a patient and see how much you can see of them when they're walking within the scope of the camera. Thank you, Tom. Um, and this next one, Angela, if you wanna start, and I don't know, Tom may have something to add to it, um, but what are, your, what are your points of view on not using HIPAA regulations and applications like Zoom on telepractice due to the COVID crisis? You know, when we look at from a speech language pathology standpoint with telepractice, um, you know, and ASHA, the um, recommendations, requirements of wanting to make sure you're ensuring and you're using those same code of conduct and ethics that you would for in person. So, um, I personally, you know, when we're doing the teleclasses, we're, we're putting um, all the measures in place to do those things in a HIPAA compliant manner. 
Um, you know, I feel like there's several options that are out there from a speech therapy standpoint to be able to do things in a HIPAA compliant manner um, with the different options available. So, you know, it, it's with our patients trying to give them that same um, level of privacy security that they would get with those in-person treatments. So even though there has been some um, laxing of the HIPAA requirements, and they've actually indicated that platforms like Zoom and Skype and FaceTime would be okay, there's still that overlying responsibility of adhering to patient privacy practices to the best of your ability. So if there is a platform that is HIPAA compliant versus one that's not, my recommendation is always go with the one that's HIPAA compliant because this time period will come to an end and we're all going to have to adapt to the previous level of HIPAA compliancy. So why not start it now? Great, thank you both for that. Um, and Tom, I'll have you take this one on LSVT Big. Um, certainly it would be difficult to perform an initial PT evaluation via telehealth platforms, but do you think this is possible? Well, that's one of the things that we've been considering for quite a while. And uh, when we started talking about providing these webinars for clinicians, our recommendations have been to, to do this with people that you initially started treatment with prior to COVID and then had to stop. So you've had the evaluations done and you have all that documentation. Having said that, when it's time for you to do your discharge or your reassessments, you may not be able to repeat some of the tests and measures that you did in a clinical environment. So you'll have to indicate that and uh, maybe choose a few other things. But if you go out and take a look at some of the assessments that we do have at our, uh, at our hands, um, not all of them require any special equipment or place settings and things of that nature. So start to utilize some of those. Um, it will be different. Uh, a lot of the assessments might be timed activities. How long does it take a person to put their shoe on? How long does it take them to get out of the chair? And how many times, how many tries does it take or attempts? So uh, the, the assessment portion of it is a challenge. That's one of the things that we encourage folks to consider if they're going to do any type of research. What does it take in order to do an appropriate assessment via telehealth that's going to give you the same type of um, basis for, of treatment and be able to document the outcomes. Thank you, Tom. Um, and Angela, if you can take this one, is this covered by Medicare? Currently, tele, practice telehealth, speech therapy, physical occupational therapies are not covered by Medicare. Um, prior to COVID-19, um, if someone had Medicare, they had to go for in-person therapies. They did not have the option of telehealth. Now, the difference that's happened with the COVID is that um, individuals, if they are Medicare beneficiaries, can choose to private pay for speech, physical, and occupational therapies, but they're not currently covered, uh, reimbursed by Medicare. Let me jump in with that reimbursement concept. Um, Medicare Advantage plans are sponsored by private insurance companies like United Healthcare and Cigna and, and organizations like that. Those private health insurance companies have greatly expanded their scope of coverage for to include therapy services, and they have to provide that same level of coverage for their Medicare Advantage plan patients as well. So as Angela said, under traditional Medicare, coverage is not available right now. Um, we hope that we're going to be getting some information from CMS to indicate that they're uh, making some adjustments to that. But as the rules stand right now, traditional Medicare, no. Medicare Advantage plans and private insurance companies, probably yes. Always check with each individual insurance company for the appropriate coverage capabilities and limitations. Thanks for that additional part, Tom. That's great. Sure. Okay, um, Angela, this is a client um, sh who was in the middle of LSVT Loud when it got interrupted. Um, they're wondering if, I, if they need a new referral to finish the balance of classes and will the therapist contact them or should 
uh, this individual call and set up a telehealth appointment? What I would do first is contact the therapist that you were working with. Um, and, you know, based on different um, restrictions, you know, if it was an if outpatient, the, the therapist um, are maybe working different hours, but you could at least get someone in the rehab department, see is this person offering any teleservices? What is, what is the department doing? Um, because since you started with that person, it would be nice if you could continue and pick up with that person. And then um, based on your individual insurance, it will determine you know what type of authorization or reassessment or that sort of thing that you might need so that would be a question for your insurance and for the therapist as well if the therapist is not offering teleservices or that department is not offering teleservices then if you contact us at um, info at this uh, email that you see here we would be happy to try to assist you depending on where you live and trying to find someone who could um, provide LSBT loud via the telehealth or the e-loud provider and then once again there might be some caveats depending on your insurance and that sort of thing. And as Tom mentioned, for the services to be provided, it would need to be a speech therapist who is in the state where you live. So if you can provide that information as well, that would be helpful. All right, great, thanks, Angela. And so we've got one more question come through. If you think of additional questions, please feel free to email us at info at lsvtglobal.com. So Tom, if you can take this last one, if you are new to telehealth, what is your experience becoming a provider by different payers? Does being LSVT Big certified assist in becoming a provider for insurance companies? Well, there really is no difference between uh, an in-person visit and the, um, the billing process versus telehealth. So if you are um, in a, an insurance network and you're an in-network provider for say the Blue Cross Blue Shield plans, you're already covered. Uh, there are certain codes for a place of service as well as modifiers that you have to add to your traditional CPT codes. And when you call that insurance company, ask them which modifiers do they require and which place of service do they require. So there is a new place of service call code of 02, which is in addition to 11 and 12 office or home. And for a lot of insurances, they've uh, accepted that 02 as a place of service. Others have not. And so it's, you know, unfortunately, it's on a one on one basis because even what applies with Blue Cross Blue Shield in Delaware may not apply to Blue Cross Blue Shield in Pennsylvania. All right, thank you, Tom, and thank you to both of our panelists here today and to everybody in the audience. We'll go ahead and wrap up now um, and sign off, but here's our information on this final slide um, that you can always contact us. And your handout, if you didn't receive it via email prior to the webinar, you can also find in your webinar control panel under the handouts tab. Um, and again, thanks for joining us. We hope that you're able to join us for another webinar later this month. So everybody take good care. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.